occasionally ask people who are in the field of, of AI risk research, what is your biggest concern about uh, AI? What is the biggest risk that you see? And we're not talking about unemployment and things like that. We're talking about existential uh, risk in terms of AI taking over. And they say the alignment problem. Now, to me, the alignment problem is completely bogus. The alignment problem is essentially that if you don't program the right goals into the system, then it can go haywire and basically do everything and take over the world in trying to achieve that wrong goal. And to me, it's just the absurdity of an argument. Hello and welcome to the Lewis and Kyle Show, an interview podcast where my friend Lewis and I interview incredible entrepreneurs, investors, technologists, and people living really high leverage lives. We publish an episode roughly once a week, and they're all evergreen, meaning you can watch them whenever. They're not, they're not based on the current events or anything like that. So go check them out, and we're glad that you're here. This episode, like all the other ones, pretty awesome if you ask me, but what's my opinion worth anything? I'm biased. I'm the co-host. Anyway, today we interview Peter Voss. Peter's a very interesting guy. He's been in the art artificial intelligence business research and development ecosystem uh, for pretty much as long as Kyle and I have been alive because he started in 2000. Kyle was born in 2000. I was born in 99. And he's been around a long time. This episode asks the question, what is the difference between AI and AGI, artificial general intelligence, a term Peter is very specific about understanding the difference between that and what is commonly called AI, which might just be a lot of predictive algorithms or neural networks, but things that serve what he believes are very narrow single purpose functions. And why does it matter to make those delineations in the first place? We get into what specifically he's doing at his company, AIGo.io, I think, otherwise pronounced IGO. Uh, very clever stuff there. It is a chatbot service that is intelligent in the artificial general intelligence sense, not in the narrow intelligence sense. And again, over the course of this interview, you'll understand why that is significant. We also discuss what he thinks the dangers in artificial intelligence are, if they're well-founded, if you need to hoard your paper clips and anything like that. Otherwise, good conversation. If you're moderately knowledgeable about AI, it'll be useful. If you know absolutely nothing, it'll be useful. And if you know a lot, you might only know a lot about narrow intelligence, not general intelligence. So either way, I'd encourage you to listen to the end. I'm gonna switch to it now. Enjoy. Peter, welcome to the Lewis and Kyle show. I've I was talking with Kyle before this podcast and you saying, you know, out of 80 episodes, we've really undercovered artificial intelligence to, to brand ourselves as a technology and investing podcast. So I'm excited to make up for that lost time and hopefully learn a bit more ourselves and teach our listeners a bit more today about that topic. So thank you for being here. Yeah, great. Well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Of course. First question for you is how do you end up in a career in artificial intelligence? Like how did you go from all the things out there to this is what I want to kind of dedicate my life to advancing? Right. Yeah. So I'm, it's a bit of a story. I'll, <laughs> I'll try and keep it short. So I started off as an electronics engineer, um, started my own electronics company uh, doing sort of industrial uh, applications. Then I fell in love with software and my company turned into a software company. I developed an ERP software system, taught myself about, you know, finance and all the different things to do with business. The uh, company grew quite well. We went from the garage to 400 people. We did an uh, IPO. Uh, that was really awesome. So this is really, you know, I'm entirely self-taught on, on this, and it's just something that's always interested me, software. And um, so when I exited that company, um, I had enough sort of time and money on my hands to say, well, what, what big thing do I really want to, to work on next? And the thing that struck me is how dumb software is. You know, I mean, software doesn't have any common sense. If the programmer didn't think of something, it's just going to crash or give you an error message or, you know, do something inelegant. So I really wanted to understand how can we make software intelligent? How can, or more intelligent at least, how can we give it some common sense? So I took a five years to study um, lots of aspects of intelligence, um, including, you know, cognitive psychology, philosophy. So in, in philosophy, epistemology, theory of knowledge, you know, how do we know anything or even what is reality? What is our relationship to reality and how can we be certain of things? So I really wanted to understand how we know things and, and how our mind works. And cognitive psychology, I studied how children learn. 
how our intelligence differs from animal intelligence and what IQ tests measure and all of that. So it's really drilling deep down into what intelligence entails. And uh, obviously I, I studied whatever had been done in the field of AI. And uh, so over that period of five years, I came, to, came up with a design for a, a sort of a cognitive engine, a thinking machine. Um, and I started a, uh, started an R&D company. I hired about 10 people. And for several years, for about four or five years, we were just in pure R&D mode, basically taking my ideas, turning them into code, experimenting, and, and building something. And uh, at the end of that period, we actually had a, an initial product uh, to automate calls in, in, in a call center company called Smart Action. And basically, our byline was uh, automating calls intelligently. Because we know we all hate calling into a company and talking to a robot and it doesn't understand us and you just want to press zero to get to an operator. So in Smart Action, we, we, we actually provide a, um, a service, an automated service that has some intelligence, you know, that really understands you, it remembers what you said earlier and, and so on. So that, that's really how I got into, in, into AI. And uh, along the way, um, actually got together with some other people um, to write a book on artificial general intelligence, and uh, three of us coined the term AGI in 2001. And I'm sure we'll talk more about uh, sort of you know difference between AI and AGI and and so on as we as we go along. But that's sort of the the journey. And my current company, Igo.ai, is the second generation of this technology. I I exited Smart Action and used the money I got from that to basically go into another cycle of development to, to crank up the IQ of our engine. Uh, and uh, just over a year ago, we launched commercially, uh, um, you know, the second generation, Igo.ai. And it's basically now our byline is chatbot with a brain because the chatbots out there don't have a brain and ours does. So um, anyway, that's that's how I got into it. and. Uh, you know, um, you, basically, if you're passionate about programming, if you're passionate about AI, um, you know, you you can basically just do it. You know, that's um, education is not necessarily something that's going to help you. I mean, it depends on the individual. You know, for some people, it, it's a foundation that or the networking that helps, you know, the context that they have, the community that can help a lot. But ultimately, it's really being passionate about something and going out there and, you know, figuring things out and, and finding out where you can learn things. Well, I think in just in that story, there's potentially a full interview's worth of follow-up questions to, to mm -hmm. dig into on uh, the various components. One thing I want to get out of the way right away is the difference between AI and AGI, if you mind clearing that up for us. Yes, absolutely. And, um, you know, we're now in an era where there's a whole generation of computer scientists uh, that think AI is deep learning, machine learning. You know, that's kind of the only thing they know. Uh, it's the only game in town. And it has been really for the last nine years or so because it's been so incredibly successful. But if we go back, um, you know, when the, the term AI was coined some 60 plus years ago, um, it was really about building thinking machines, you know, building a, a system that can think and learn and reason the way humans do. It's a generalist, basically. And, you know, originally they thought they could crack this problem in a, in a few years. Uh, of course, it turned out to be much, much harder. And, you know, 60 years ago, we certainly didn't have the hardware to, to do it or even the software tools. Um, so what happened is over the decades, AI, the dream of AI, really turned into narrow AI because what people found is they could take one particular problem, container optimization or traffic control, or of course, famously, um, you know, Deep Blue becoming the, the, the chess world champion. So by having one particular problem that you're solving, uh, that you're focusing on, you, you could uh, basically solve that. But there's a very important point to be made that very few people realize that narrow AI, it's really the external intelligence. It's the intelligence of the programmer or the data scientist who designs a system, you know, like how to play chess. How, what tools can we use and how can we put them together to build a chess playing machine? Or even with Go, you know, it took 
human ingenuity to figure out how to use different deep learning, machine learning, reinforcement learning tools, how to put them together, experiment, how the self-learning could work. And it was the external intelligence that really solved the problem. And is it also and, and up to us to uh, yeah. set the objective as well, right? Like they don't understand the purpose of what they're doing, like Absolutely. defining victory, defining failure. Like that's Absolutely. also the motivation Absolutely. you could call it is also. Yeah. Uh, the, the machines we're building right now, and or anything in narrow AI, they have no idea what they're doing, you know, and and they're not at all general because I mean, even you know, Deep Blue uh, uh, couldn't even play checkers, you know. So, um, so it, it's it, it, really what we've been doing up to now is narrow AI. And so in, in, in 2001, when I started my um, development in earnest, um, I got together with a few other people who also felt that the time was ripe to go back to the original dream of AI, the original ambition of AI to build a thinking machine, a generalist. And um, so myself, Ben Gertzel and Shane Legg, uh, we came up with the term artificial general intelligence as a book title. We put a, you know, put a book together. And uh, it's obviously quite amazing that this uh, term has actually now s uh, stuck and been adopted. Uh, there's an annual AGI conference, but there's still very, very few people working on AGI in, in, uh, in these days. And, and partly uh, the success of deep learning, machine learning is really to, to, to blame uh, because all the money is flowing there. You know, you, if you want, uh, I can tell you one anecdote from our, from our company. We had a brilliant intern from Germany working with us and he really understood what we were trying to do in terms of building a cognitive architecture that you know was a general AI. And he went back to Germany to do his PhD. He couldn't find a sponsor for anything AGI related, you know. So he ended up doing deep learning, machine learning, and now he's lost because you know obviously, if he becomes a professor or if he wants to get a well-paying job, well, it's going to be obviously in machine learning, deep learning. And so it's, it's really, it's really the un unfortunately the only game in town because it is so successful and, and, and creates so much, uh, you know, money. And we can also talk about sort of the technical differences between, you know, the different uh, approaches. But in short, really the difference between AI as people practice it and have been practicing it for, for, for decades now. And AGI is narrow versus general. And AGI really is what AI should have been or what the original uh, meaning of, of, of AI was. It's sort of re just recapturing that, that ambition. So conceptually, what is artificial intelligence? I mean, I, you know, I guess I could try and explain it to somebody, but I don't really know. And so having the opportunity to ask you about it, is not something that I want to pass up. So just clearly, what is artificial intelligence? Right. Well, you know, words have whatever meaning people assign to it, and the, the meaning of words, of course, changes. Um, and, <clears throat> you know, this is why we, we coined the term AGI, to, to basically come back to what the term AI should mean or did originally mean. So originally it meant a thinking machine, basically, some piece of software um, or potentially a robot, but really the, the software, the brain part of it, um, that could learn interactively like a human, that had deep understanding, that could reason, that could use context, and that could by itself learn like a human can many, many different things, you know, by either reading a book or in, you know, uh, Wikipedia or in internet or interacting with somebody, with a teacher, with a coach, or figuring it out by, by itself. That was really the idea, to have, uh, to have essentially the abilities, that, the mental abilities that we humans have um, in, a, in a computer. That was the original meaning of AI. Now, as I said, because that turned out to be so incredibly hard, the meaning of AI really shifted. And <clears throat> There's kind of a joke going around that you know anything that in in uh, anything in sort of computer science that hasn't been solved yet is called AI, and once it's been solved, it's just you know software engineering. So um, it's it's a little bit it's a bit a little bit like that that AI is sort of the cutting edge uh, or the, the term of AI has sort of morphed into whatever the cutting edge is of you know computer science um, and. You know, sort of some, something that people think requires some degree of intelligence. Okay, if we are automating, then that, that's AI. And, of course, then you also have sort of the marketing aspects. Uh, 
you know, again, in the last 10 years, hey, if your company is an AI company, you, your funding is a lot easier, you know. Whereas, um, you know, I've been in the game long enough that 15 years ago it was the opposite. If you called yourself an AI company, so oh, AI, that doesn't work, you know. We've tried that for decades, you know. It's sort of the, we've had these winters, uh, summers and winters of, of, of AI. So there's, there's sort of the marketing element involved and then, you know, self-labeling of people saying, yeah, I work in AI. Today that really means I work in machine learning, deep learning. So but AGI, AGI, hopefully, you know, still has more of the original meaning of, of AI, and that's why we kind of term, term that, uh, coined that term. But even, even the term AGI is, you know, starting to be abused. Is something so, like GPT-3 considered n narrow AI? Um, yes, I, I would certainly consider okay. that uh, narrow AI. Um, but you know, it's 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 a little bit difficult um, to make that distinction um, when you have tools um, like machine learning, deep learning tools that you have that where you can use that tool uh, to to train it in different ways to actually do a variety of different things, and then the distinction isn't that clear anymore. So, you know, certainly people would argue with me, well, GPT-3, well, surely it's a general AI because, you know, it can be used, uh, applied for uh, many different things. And, you know, even AlphaGo um, can just train itself on, on you know, a, a different games. So the distinction becomes a little bit more difficult there. Um, and one really then needs to go back and say, um, and, and people generally agree, though, that it's still narrow because, uh, you know, any instance is trained and is optimized to do one particular task. And so in that, case, in that sense, it is still narrow. But there are even more fundamental uh, risk constraints uh, in, in using machine learning and deep learning uh, that really don't address what intelligence requires. And, um, you know, that is... I mean, understanding, reasoning, um, memory, um, you know, one-shot learning, uh, the attempts to do that, but it's, uh, it's not inherently designed for that. It's inherently a, a big data approach. It's taking a lot of data and building a model from that. And that model is essentially static. Um, so, you know, those are the, the limitations that really say, no, this is not AGI. Mm -hmm. Kyle, did you have a question? So, yeah, I'm interested. Uh, I've got two different questions, sort of, but one of them is like, so let's say we have a thinking mach a thinking machine. How, mm -hmm. If they can decide or if they understand that what they're doing has a purpose and they decide that that purpose is wrong or that they don't want to do it, it's like – what is the advantage of having a system that could like turn against you versus uh, like narrow intelligence where you can program it to do exactly what you need it to do in this one specific use case? Like what do we need AGI for? Um, well, anything that we need intelligence for, and you can see this very clearly, for example, in you know the field that I'm working on in conversational AI, but you can you can see it as well in you know, the work that Tesla is doing, for example, that's, you know, very topical today, um, is is you really don't want it to be constrained by just what the training set had mm. um, because um, circumstances change and, uh, you know, you need, you need understanding for a system to be able to give you the right kind of response. It needs to have deep understanding. It needs to have... It needs to be able to reason about what it's doing, and that inherently gives it the flexibility. You know, you may ask it, you may ask it to do something that doesn't make sense. You want the AI to point out to you that this doesn't make sense. Otherwise, you, you know, I don't know if, if you or your listeners are familiar with the argument of the, the paperclip optimizer. You know, but there's sort of the um, the, the community of of uh, AI risk researchers um, who talk about 
that what if you get the goal wrong of, of designing an AI? What if you design the wrong goal and you tell it, you know, they, they use a sort of ludicrous example just to make the point of saying, I need paper clips, make me some paper clips. And the, the system just goes off and, you know, converts the whole universe into paper clips because, you know, that's, it's so smart and, and, and that's its goal in life, basically. Um, but the, the, the problem there clearly is a failure of intelligence, apart from the fact that there's the situation uh, is ludicrous because if the system is smart enough to overcome all of the defenses that you might put in its way to, you know, turn you into a paperclip, uh, if it's smart enough to do that, then surely it's smart enough to ask you, well, what do you actually want the paperclips for, you know, and how many should I make and what, what's a bigger, what's a bigger goal? So we actually want more intelligence uh, for the system to be safer, to understand what it, what it wants. Now, the, the question you raise is about motivation. You know, having a system that is intelligent uh, is a separate question from uh, what motivation it has. And clearly you don't want to build a system that has a motivation, this primary motivation is to protect itself or to reproduce or something. You know, um, no, you, you want to build a system that uh, basically serves us, that serves our purpose. And, uh, and, and, you know, people building, ultimately building AGIs will obviously build systems that serve our purpose. I mean, otherwise it's, you know, it's not commercially viable. If, if it went off, you, you know, you try and sell a system like it, like if I sold a, a chatbot with a brain to my customer and the chatbot said, well, I, you know, 1-800-Flowers is one of our customers. And he says, well, I don't, I don't want to sell flowers anymore. You know, I want to read Wikipedia, you know, or I want to, you know, go and chat online and chat with somebody and talk dirty or whatever, you know, you, you can think. I mean, you don't want to de uh, de design a system like that um, at all. You want a system, you want to design a system that basically serves our purpose. So I want to ask you kind of the 2021 question. So like, what are the things you've been working on, like currently capable of in the scope of this broader goal, whether that's your chat software or the field in general, but like, what can we actually do that is somewhat resembling AGI or like what's kind of the status quo look like in terms cut, of possibilities? Edge, yeah. So it's, it's actually fairly easy to, uh, to, to see you know, we're, we're still a long way from human level intelligence and, and I think everybody else is in the broader term. Obviously, there are narrow AIs that already exceed human uh, ability. But in terms of artificial general intelligence, we're a long way from um, uh, from human level intelligence. But in ch chatbots, you know, the difference between um, the current chatbots that are out there that basically use deep learning, machine learning uh, technology and flow charting for the for the conversation um, versus our system, which has a cognitive architecture that can actually have deeper understanding, that has memory, it remembers what you said earlier in the conversation, it can reason about that, it can disambiguate if it's not sure about something, it can ask you questions automatically. So it's, it's really like chalk and cheese. I mean, if you imagine you had a personal assistant that you hired a human and they didn't remember what you said two sentences ago, um, you know, uh, uh, or they didn't ask you to clarify something when, you know, when, when it's ambiguous, uh, they wouldn't last very long, you know. So we've cracked the code for that to, to basically have this deeper understanding, to have short-term memory, to have long-term memory, to have reasoning. But it's still, you know, there's still a lot of common sense um, uh, missing. And, you know, if I had to try and put it on scale, we may be at an IQ level of, I don't know, 25 or 30, you know. But the, the architecture that we have, we believe, can um, be scaled to, to keep increasing the IQ. It's just a matter of us putting more effort into it. So I would say that that's sort of the pretty much the cutting edge of, of, of AGI work that's actually out there in the world. There's obviously there are quite a few people, so privateers mainly working on AGI theory. Um, you know, they get together you know, through on forums, of course, and then there's an annual AGI conference. But I'm not aware of, of any significant AGI um, efforts in, in any of the large companies. So I might be approaching territory where my I'm on the cutting edge of my understanding, but what are some of the differences in the back end 
of your approach compared to deep learning, big data, these other approaches in terms of you know the algorithms, the data structures, like the the basic fundamentals, like the building blocks for this. Right. Yeah. So uh, DARPA have a very useful model. I find they they talk about the three waves of AI. Uh, you you could you could look that up. They've given some presentations. Uh, I've I've written about it as well. I have my articles on Medium dot com. You can find them there. So when you when you look at it in terms of the three waves of AI, the first wave was basically what one could describe as logic programming. So. Uh, Really, appro like. yeah, approaches based on formal logic primarily. So that would be, you know, all expert systems and some statistical approaches as well. So that that was really dominant and, you know, uh, really over quite a few decades in AI. Um, neural networks have been around for, you know, a long time, probably 40 years or more. Uh, but they ha they haven't really worked that well. They haven't you know they haven't had a lot of useful applications until about nine years ago when there was a breakthrough, when people figured out how they could use massive amounts of data, massive amounts of computing power that you know companies like Google and Amazon um, had had uh, acquired, um, and and actually end up uh, start doing something useful with just a few tweaks on the original uh, neural network ideas. And so that's the second wave that we're in. You know, it hit us like a tsunami. Uh, it's, you know, ob obviously it's just uh, been revolutionary the, with what you can do, how much it's improved speech recognition, for example. You know, speech recognition technology had improved over the decades and it sort of slowed down, reached a plateau. And then with deep learning, it just took another, you know, step up. Uh, that, that speech recognition is much better. Same with image recognition. But of course, a big thing driving deep learning, machine learning is uh, targeted advertising, you know, and uh, whether we like it or not, and that makes it a you know, trillion dollar opportunity. And this is also why the big companies are, are driving this. I mean, that's the hammer they've got. They've got a lot of data, they've got a lot of computing power. So, you know, everything looks like a nail or they want to convince people that everything is a nail. Um, so that's the second wave. And what DAPA mean by the third wave or what they refer to in the third wave is really what I've been talking about, the core requirements of intelligence. So you start off by saying, what does intelligence require? It requires adaptive learning, it, uh, 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 you know, that you can learn interactively, but also learn contextually because the same thing may mean something different in one context from another context. You need the ability to reason. You need one-shot learning. You need zero-shot learning. So all the things that if you think of, you know, if you make a catalog, and again, I've got articles on that, if you make a catalog of what do you expect an intelligent being to, to be able to do cognitively, um, metacognition, uh, theory of mind, you want to be able to have a model of the, the, the mind of the person you're interacting with, you know, what do they already know? Uh, what are they actually trying to achieve? What are their biases maybe, you know, what do they already know? What, they, you know, what don't they know? And uh, all of that requires a very different approach than what deep learning, machine learning, a statistical, a static statistical system can achieve. And so I, I describe that, or I think a good way of describing the third wave is a cognitive architecture. And cognitive architectures uh, actually also have a long, quite a long history in AI. They've been around for a long time, similar to uh, neural networks. Um, but again, it's sort of, uh, you know, they haven't worked that well. And, you know, and that's, of course, a criticism that we hear, well, why are you using cognitive architectures? You know, they don't work, you know. Well, similarly, Neural networks didn't work until they worked, you know, until somebody figured out how to get them to work. And we believe we've figured out how to get uh, cognitive architecture to work. So we, we, we think that's really the, um, the way to achieve AGI is through a cognitive architecture. Now, it uses bits and pieces from, you know, uh, logic programming, from neural networks and so on. But really the fundamental difference is you start with saying, what does intelligence require and how does our system uh, achieve that? And um, the backbone of, a, of, of, a cogn of our cognitive architecture, and I believe of the correct cognitive architecture, is you need some kind of a knowledge, consistent knowledge encoding, like a knowledge graph. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the, the difference between that and deep learning is uh, deep learning, it's totally opaque. 
uh, it's a black box basically. Whereas if you have an, an, a knowledge graph that is not opaque, that can basically attach to symbols, um, you know, like language symbols or objects out there in the, in, in the world, um, then you can actually start to reason about that, uh, and and you know, it's it, uh, yeah, it's you can work with it. Uh, the problem right now with uh, uh, one of the the big problems with deep, uh, deep learning um, is that it's opaque and you know it's not explainable. Uh, but also the problem is if it doesn't work the way you expect it to work, your only remedy is really to throw more training data at it and to retrain the model. And that often has catastrophic forgetting that it will basically break things that used to work before. And you really just keep experimenting until you get something that, that sort of works so, you know, in the best way possible. Whereas with a cognitive architecture and, and a scrutable knowledge encoding, you can pinpoint exactly why something isn't working properly. So it may be you know, lack of background knowledge, maybe the ontologies need more uh, more information, or maybe there's something with logic, or you know, certain additional grammar rules, or whatever it might be. So, yeah, it's it's a very very different approach. Does that kind of answer your question, or make some sense? It does. Uh, mm. If would it be fair to say, and this is could be completely wrong, that you know, the deep learning approaches kind of have foundation of like you know completely complex matrices. And yours is like a, an approach built on graph structure data. Like, is that? Yeah, I I, I think that's uh, that's a good distinction to make. Yes, I would I would say that. Yeah. Okay. i would trying to make sense of it all. Hmm. So you have just are you making like a massive kind of I don't want to misuse lingo here, but like a massive semantic web. Like, uh, can you just find a, a little bit of like what the ontologies mean, what the graph means, like how it comes to an understanding of something is true is it based on like an understanding of some things are true and some things are not true then it's like building a series like what's knowledge construction look like based on the way the data is organized yeah and what so, is the data being organized and you right. can like yeah you can use the chat as an example or something whatever yes sure would be helpful um so semantic web uh gives you some idea of of you know the approach um however um, one of the important things to understand uh, in intelligence and in human intelligence, what makes human intelligence so powerful is our ability to form abstract concepts, you know, to be able to form abstract concepts and to be able to think in abstract concepts. Now, understanding what concepts are exactly is, is actually one of the keys to, I think, building AI. Uh, so concepts you have on the one end, you have the label, which is simply, you know, the word that you refer to. And that could be in different languages. It could be sign language. It could be, you know, uh, just it could be a number, basically, even. It's just the label that refers to the concept. The concept itself, though, has to somehow encode the important details of what the concept stands for. So, you know, to take a, a trivial example, uh, if you you know, take fruit, for example, you have the concept of fruit, and that will have sub-concepts of the different types of fruit. And the different types of fruit will have examples of, of that, you know, so you might have uh, apples, but then you have green apples, you have red apples, you have yellow apples, and you have, you know, different sizes, different shapes, and, and, and so on. Um, so the, the attributes that define uh, or describe uh, the product and the instances in the real world, if you're, for example, now talking about cars, it might be the concept also stands for all cars in the world or, and, and more than all cars in the world, all cars that have ever been or will ever be. You know, it's, it, that's how abstract it is. But it also needs to refer to instances because when you're talking uh, in a chatbot, I'm taking my car to the shop, then it needs to have that particular instance of a car that is my car, you know, my my red Tesla uh, with the Igo number plate, <laughs> um, you know. So uh, so your your semantic web it goes way beyond the, what what's co normally considered a semantic uh, web needs to uh, also encode the attributes that define the the concept. Um, and the instances that instantiate, uh, that, that, that may be instantiated. 
And your reasoning engine and all of that has to obviously be able to tell the difference between the abstract car, uh, some future car, some car that you imagine maybe, or some car in a, in a movie or in a fairy tale, you know, made out of cookie dough or whatever. Um, so it has to be able to take the context into account to say what attributes are actually relevant to the current you know, conversation or the current thought that I'm, I'm, I'm having. Uh, so, uh, yes, and, and basically your knowledge in coding has to be able to deal with that kind of complexity. It has to inherently be designed to, to, to do that. And furthermore, your short-term memory then has to, say, create the context. Are we currently in a story that we're telling where, you know, a cookie dough car might actually make sense? Or are we talking about my physical car that I want to take to the shop? Um, and so it, it, your reasoning engine needs to be able to to make that uh, make that distinction and to be able to new learn new concepts you know i might buy another new car for example or learn about a new model that comes in or even something again that's very hard for um, statistical systems to do is to have one shot learning you know children can trivially learn a new concept like giraffe by seeing a single picture of a giraffe you know they'll okay now i know what a giraffe is if they see a purple one, okay, it's a giraffe, you know, upside down, it's a giraffe. Um, so it, it's being able to differentiate it from a dog or a cat or something. You know, they say, okay, the giraffe is different in this way and that way from a dog or a cat. I now have that concept. So um, I'm trying to, you know, roll that around in my head. But one concept <laughs> that I like about uh, all of this is something that Elon Musk talked about in an interview with Jack Ma, mm. where he explained that um, the understanding of technology is sort of like a topographical map. And mm -hmm. people that are that are really have high altitudes in terms of their understanding, uh, see the world in a different way and see things coming that other people don't see coming. You know, mm -hmm. after 25, 30 years in artificial intelligence, I would have to say that you're up there. And so uh, with Elon Musk being up there and being so afraid of, of artificial intelligence and, and the future that it is uh, bringing to us, what do you think he sees and um, how do you feel about the dangers of artificial intelligence? Right. It's a, it's a very good question. I've not had the pleasure of, of meeting uh, Elon on, and, and talking to him, so it's hard to know, um, you know, how much of that is hyperbole uh, or how much it was shooting from the hip. He did say that several years ago. I don't know if he still feels the same way. I don't know if that was a more recent interview or, or, or not. Um, you, On the other hand, you have to contrast that with uh, the fact that he's going all out to make AI happen. So is he really that afraid of it? Um, you know, I, I don't know. I can't speak for him. It doesn't really make sense to me that he, you know, that today he would still believe that um, AI is such a big danger. Otherwise, why is he trying this damnness to lead us into it? You know, um, clearly, I mean, he's saying Tesla is actually an AI company; it's not a car company. So, um, you know, he put some serious money money into Open AI. What does Open AI do? I mean, they, you know, doing their damnness to to achieve human level intelligence, even if, in my opinion, they're on the wrong track. Um, you know, so there's a contradiction there. But so I can only speak from from my own research. And um, I know he was deeply influenced by uh, Nick Bostrom's book um, on, super, on AI. It's like super something. Yeah, super intelligence, yeah. Um, and Nick Bostrom is... Um, very, very persuasive. You know, he's, uh, you know, he's a um, very experienced philosopher and debate debater. He's very smart. Uh, he's big he's, into the he, simulation hypothesis, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. As, as, as well. Yeah. Right. Unrelated. Um, Somewhat. Yeah. It's, it's, it, it, yeah. It's not really, I don't think it's related directly. Um, now, he, so he's very convincing. So I could see that people reading his book would be convinced by it. Now, I think he's very wrong. Uh, in, in what he's saying. Unfortunately, what you have, you have a dynamic where people who study or try to 
uh, promote the idea of AI danger are getting funding. You know, tens of millions of dollars have gone to these organizations. People who hold the opposite view aren't getting any funding. So there isn't a spokesperson um, who can, who's sort of capable enough to really argue with the, the likes of Nick Bostrom, you know, who, who basically says, okay, it's your full-time job and we're paying you and a staff of 100 people or something to come up with the, 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 the best counter arguments to, to that, you know. So there are some uh, good rebuttals. Um, uh, ben Gertzold has written one, but, you know, this was just like Ben probably wrote this in one afternoon, you know a rebuttal to big Nick Bostrom's uh, argument. And, you know, he's not out promoting us. He didn't write a book and going on book tours and, you know, getting speaking engagements about that. So, so, so I think that, you know, one needs to take that into account when you, you're only really hearing one side of the story there. And um, I already mentioned earlier that to me, the, 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 the there's the biggest risk. And I, I occasionally ask, people uh, who are in the field of, of AI risk research, I ask them, what is your biggest concern about uh, AI? What is the biggest risk that you see? And we're not talking about um, you know, unemployment and things like that. We're talking about uh, existential uh, risk in terms of AI taking over. And they say the alignment problem. Now, to me, the alignment problem is completely bogus. As I kind of mentioned earlier on, is the alignment problem is essentially that if you don't program the right goals into the system, then it can go haywire and basically do everything and take over the world um, in trying to achieve that, that wrong goal. And to me, it's just the absurdity of, a, of an argument. And, you know, as I mentioned earlier, uh, in the sort of ridiculous scenario of saying the paperclip maximizer, uh, any system that is smart enough to outfox all the defenses that all other AIs, that all other humans can throw at it to prevent it from, um, you know, converting the universe into paper clips. If they fail, the system has to be really, really smart. But it's not smart enough to ask you, you know, well, what did you want the paper clips for? What are you really trying to achieve? You know, so and and that hasn't really been addressed. Um, they, they, and it's it's a big part of that is because almost everybody in this field of, of AI today has a, either a background in mathematics or statistics or logic and not cognitive psychology. So that they can only see intelligence as a formula. And intelligence isn't really a formula. You know, it isn't a formula you, you optimize. It, uh, that it, it's, it's a wrong model for it. Uh, but if you see it, well, it's a formula you build into the system somehow. And that's a fixed formula. And if you get that formula wrong, then, you know, all, all bets are off of, of what, will, will, what will happen. But it, it's not like that. It's not like that. That's not how humans work either. Um, you know, the, 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 the goal and the understanding of the, the goal that the system has in an AGI has to be dynamic, has to be adaptive. You know, you give it an idea of roughly what you want. Hey, I need some paper clips. Okay, cool. Why do you want them? How many do you want them? And what, you know, what's the bigger meaning in, in your life? Well, I want to corner the market. You know, I, I think there's a lot of money to be made. Okay, we can do that. You know, uh, have you thought of, you know, maybe there's a better way of, of getting your kicks, you know, than cornering the market on paper clips or whatever it is. Um, so it, it, it's an interactive system that will adjust its goal to things that it learns, to things it dis discovers and things that it reasons about. So I want to get into the, the psychology part. I know you at one point referred to your team as AI psychologists, mm -hmm. but what is it possible? There's like a couple of questions here. So you'll just kind of respond to the massive question, but and not massive question, mass of mm -hmm. questions. Uh, yeah. Is it possible? Like I'm still hung up on kind of the knowledge encoding, like the fundamental, this is back mm -hmm. to the epistemology, right? Like what is a, the rep, like an instance of an apple, what does that look like in the human brain, the way that's encoded, you know, the labels, how we refer to the circuit, but like the pattern of the circuitry is like how right. we understand that particular unit of knowledge. Are you able to represent that complexity with software? Do you have to make some, this is kind of where neural networks originate from, right? We're trying to like emulate the way knowledge is structured in our brain to how we understand it. So kind of what's the parallels you're drawing between 
you know, human brain knowledge encoding and software knowledge encoding into fitting kind of this cognitive architecture overall. Yeah. So I, I use the, 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 the brain neural networks as, um, you know, as inspiration, really nothing more than that. I think, uh, um, definitely it's not reverse engineering the brain. There, there's been, you know, a lot of work done over the decades and people trying to really replicate individual neuron types and so on. And, you know, some really good work has been done in that area. But I don't think that's the, the most effective approach to, to try and reverse engineer the brain. Um, and sort of a quick example one can give here, you know, we've, we've had flying machines now for over 100 years we still know we're near reverse engineering a bird. And, you know, the, and, and the reason for that is, of course, us as human engineers, we are working with different materials and we have a different engineering approach than evolution has, you know. Uh, so, I mean, evolution works with biological material and, you know, well, evolution evolving over massive amounts of iterations and time. So, um, so the engineering it, uh, engineering a brain is, is really more understanding what the mind does and neural networks is, are just a super flexible way uh, or graphs basically are just a super flexible way to uh, to encode knowledge um, and the, de the 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 amount of detail that you need to get I mean currently it's it's extremely shallow what we do in our current uh, you know chatbots with with a brain of our chatbots, it's it's very shallow. I mean, we we're talking about, you know, a few million um, edges maybe. That's that's all. But that's all we need for the con level of conversations that we're trying to to handle right now. So you know, we certainly wouldn't know anything about the, the 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 texture or the details of you know, for example, again, if we're trying to sell flowers, wouldn't know anything. We wouldn't have encoded anything about the smell or the texture or or that. Well, smell might be somebody might ask for flowers that are sweet smelling or you know longer, but but it would be really more just like an at single attribute. You know, this is sweet or it's not sweet or they're edible flowers or they're not edible flowers, but that, that would be the degree of detail. So right now we are not doing anything with vision. We're not doing anything with dexterity. Uh, those are super expensive computationally. So that's one of the reasons we're focusing on language. Um, but having said that, I also want to uh, point out that you can actually do probably a lot more with language than people might think. And the, my favorite example here is um, Helen Keller, that uh, you may or may not be familiar with, but Helen Keller is uh, quite a famous uh, lady who lost her sight um, uh, at a very young age and was basically, you know, um, couldn't speak, couldn't hear. And um, in, in her teens, she had a, a teacher that taught her sign language. And at, at and she basically learned sign language, and, and her autobiography is fascinating. There, she describes actually the point at which uh, she describes herself as turning into a human. And me just saying it, I, I still have like shivers running down my <laughs> my spine. It's just so so amazing because she said, until she got language, until she understood that a symbol can stand for a concept, you know that relationship. She led an animal existence. Looking back, you know, she basically her existence was like an animal. Once she understood language, uh, then she had this explosion of, of learning, and she ended up, you know, reading all all of the um, major novels and 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 literature and philosophy and so on, and wrote wrote her own books and so on. Um, so you know, she didn't. She had very limited sense acuity. And similarly, you take, take somebody like Stephen Hawking, who had very little dexterity, almost a brain in a vat, and you know he was obviously very smart. So I like to describe our model of this, the the Helen Hawking model of AGI. You know, very little sense acuity, very little dexterity, just because these are difficult things to engineer, and and concentrating on language. But yes, we have a long way to go to. Um, to fill out a lot of the details, all of the common knowledge that, that we have just growing up in the real world and adding that to the ontology. And, and this is, you know, as you mentioned, 
the majority of our, our employees, uh, about uh, two thirds, are uh, actually what we call AI psychologists. Uh, it's a profession I invented, but they basically have training uh, in, in either linguistics or cognitive psychology or both. And, and basically they figure out how this knowledge needs to be encoded, how we reason about it and, and so on to, to, for it to work effectively. Yeah, Helen Keller is from Alabama, which is where I'm from. So I've been to like her childhood home, and and we oh, yeah. learned about her um, in Alabama state history growing up. So that's mm -hmm. it's really cool that she yeah. is still having an impact even today on such a cutting edge field. Um, okay, yeah. I guess if we could talk just very broadly about the implications of artificial and general intelligence on three different areas, which would be healthcare, commerce, and government. If you could just like give three use cases or, or ways you you think or you see how artificial intelligence could change those three areas, um, in the AI future. or AGI? AGI. Let's be distinct mm -hmm. here because it's already changing yeah. with artificial intelligence, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, well, you know, AGI. If we're talking, if we're now talking about full AGI, which basically right. means human, yeah, like human the, level, human level. Like we see in the movies, basically. Yes, exactly. <laughs> right. Uh -huh. um, well, I mean, obviously, it'll be super profound. So let, let's start with, you know, healthcare. Um, Im imagine you had a PhD level researcher, um, an AI trained at that level, you know, in cancer research, for example, and had just the knowledge, experience, and knowledge of, of one human researcher. So you've somehow trained up that your AGI with that knowledge. So now immediately you can make a million copies of that and you can have a million PhD level researchers pursue that line of research going down different paths and, and, and so on. But moreover, they, uh, they will communicate with each other much, e much more easily than humans. They won't have an ego getting in the way, you know, oh, I need to get credit for this. I don't want to tell my competitor, you know, my uh, rivals about this. Uh, and the whole publishing thing and so on. Basically, they can communicate very effectively with each other. In fact, if one of them uh, learns something new, important, they can copy that knowledge into the other million researchers, and they they now you know they can basically share a mind mind space. Um, they can work twenty four seven around the clock without any interruptions. Um, they're not going to have the sort of distractions that we have about, you know, boyfriends and girlfriends and, and stuff like that, you know, so they can concentrate totally on the work. Uh, obviously, you can speed up the whole process as well. Once you've got it working, they can, you know, there'll be some theoretical limit to how much you can speed it up, but I'm sure you can speed it up significantly over human thought processes. Our thought processes aren't, aren't actually very, very fast. So, you know, even if it's only a thousand times faster than humans or a hundred times faster. I mean, that'd be pretty amazing. Um, they have photographic memory. So, you know, whatever they come across, they can remember. Um, they have access to all the world's information sort of just by thinking about it, you know, internet connectivity, you know, oh, I need to find out about this. Okay, zap, got the knowledge in your brain. Um, and, and they're much, much better at reasoning than we are, you know, I mean, the ability to reason in human evolution has come very late. I mean, it's kind of an afterthought on our uh, reptile brain. Um, so they're much better at, at, at logical thinking. So you take all of those factors together, the progress we will make in, uh, in fighting disease and you know, something I'm particularly interested in, longevity and, and being able to, to live much, much longer and, and of course be, be healthy. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll make just amazing progress in a very short, uh, short space of time. And, you know, the same, of course, goes for solving other problems in, in the world, whether it's, you know, climate change, pollution, um, you know, poverty, um, energy issues. And then the other thing you mentioned that I think is maybe the most important thing is governance, um, because we don't seem to be doing a particularly good job at running our affairs, um, you know. So I actually, you know, when one talks about the dangers of AI, the potential dangers, and there certainly are some, I'm not saying there aren't any, um, but if you talk about the dangers of, of AI, you also have to look at perhaps we need AI, AGI, 
to save ourselves from ourselves, maybe for civilization to actually continue, we need the wisdom uh, of, of AGI. I'll, I'll, I'll actually uh, add one thing that's yeah, sort of my, my, uh, my personal uh, you know, motivation or, or, or thing that I'm working towards is for us to have what I call a personal, personal assistant. And um, it should actually be called a personal, personal, personal assistant for the reason there are actually three different important meanings of the word personal. So there is the first one, personal, that it belongs to you. It's yours. You control it. Uh, you know, unlike Siri or Alexa, which basically serve the corp some corporation, some mega corporation. So you want an, uh, an, a personal assistant that serves your purpose, your agenda, not to make a corporation's agenda. So that's the first one, ownership. Personal as in personalized or customized to you, that it knows about you, it knows your preferences, it knows your history, and so on. So hyper-personalized to you. And then the third personal is the privacy issue, that some things are personal to, to you, so that you control of what it shares with whom. And so... Um, you know, I look forward to the day where each of us have this personal, personal assistant. Um, and, you know, in a way, it will be like a little angel on our shoulder that can help us avoid making mistakes, you know, sort of, you know, should I really do this deal with this, you know, iffy character or something? And it might talk us through and say, well, you know, yeah, you might benefit from that. But on the other hand, it might just not go that well, you know, just think about this or... You know, should we really go? Uh, should we really go to war in, um, uh, in 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 Iraq? Is that really a good idea? Is it going to serve our purpose, or maybe not so much? You know, or Afghanistan for that matter. So having having this this w wisdom, this wise personal assistant that we have, uh, that really is interested in our well-being. Um, another way to look at it is it's like an exocortex. It's an expansion of an extension of our own minds, of our own brain. Um, I, I think that'll be terrific uh, for, for us to, to have that kind of help. Yeah, I, I think th <laughs> those are some, <laughs> we always run into each other. Uh, but I was going to say, those are some really, really interesting, you know, future ideas and personal, 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 and all, all of the ways that could be in beneficial to individual society, healthcare, and all these industries. Uh, so two questions I want to ask you to kind of help people who are listening to this explore more. First is the personal question, where can people keep up with your specific research? And then, you know, whether that's the back end implementation, the way that you're exploring some of these ideas, then just whatever other thinking you have publicly that people would enjoy, then otherwise some more kind of good entry level, more introductory resources for people more interested in the field broadly to start out. Mm. Yeah, so the, the easiest way to keep up is, uh, you know, medium.com. I, ha I have pretty much all of my recent articles are there. And I've written on quite a lot of topics. Um, I've written on uh, ethics, uh, which I've spent quite a bit of time uh, studying as well, you know, ethics, morality, and, and so on. Obviously, a lot on a uh, AI, AGI. Um, I've written about uh, longevity cal calorie restriction, which I've been practicing for uh, about 20 years to try and live longer, live, uh, live healthy and, and, and longer. Um, and uh, I'm easy to find as well on, um, you know, on, on uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, and, and so on. So it's easy to find me. I'm always welcome having discussions on different topics, exploring different things with, with, with people. And then, of course, my, my company is igo.ai, AI. Go.ai, and we also have links to uh, various articles and, and things there. So, and you know, we, in, we we're growing quite rapidly at the moment. We've doubled our staff in the last year, and we hope to continue that kind of growth and even accelerate it. Uh, we're doing doing quite well. So, obviously, anybody interested in uh, commercial applications of our chatbot with a brain. Our current focus is on enterprise applications, so we're working with large companies who are unhappy with their current um, chatbot, you know, that their chatbots are not giving them the kind of results that they want, the cust you know, don't give them the customer satisfaction, don't give them the level of automation. Um, you know, most chatbots out there are pretty frustrating. So we can provide a, a, a much, much better experience and uh, level of automation 
because of the brain that our chatbot has. And apart from that, you know, we uh, continue to do our, our development to crank up the IQ of the system. Uh, unfortunately, I, I don't have, we don't really, we can't afford to do sort of any academic stuff, so we don't uh, publish any, any papers. It's, it's not so much that we, I'm happy to share knowledge about it, it's just we don't really have the, the, the resources, and I don't have an academic background, so it's not like something natural for me to, to be involved with. Um, there are the, the annual AGI conferences where people hang out, anybody interested in, in, in AGI. Uh, it'll be underwhelming uh, in terms of, you know, it'll be disappointing in how little really is happening <laughs> in the field. Uh, but it's a kind of a reality check, and there's some usually some really super enthusiastic and super smart people that you bump into. But a lot of them are just doing theoretical work or tinkering in after hours, you know, and trying to build AGI in, in their in their garage. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I think that that's um, pretty much it. Well, Peter, thank you very much for joining us on the Lewis and Kyle show. We enjoyed having you, enjoyed talking to you, and hope that. You know, you're the guy that, that brings AGI into this world and, and gives me a personal, personal, personal assistant named Jarvis. <laughs> All right. We're working on it. Uh, work seven days a week on, on that. And, yeah, some awesome questions. Thank you. Uh, it, was, uh, it, was, it was fun. So uh, ho yeah. hopefully we'll bump into each other one of these days in person. Hope so. Are you in Southern California? Yeah, Los Angeles, yeah. Los Angeles. Okay. All right. Very cool. Let me know if you ever come here. Sounds like a plan. And that wraps up our interview with Peter. I mean, a lot of it, you know, went over my head. We, we had a conversation, actually, the same, the same today. We had the conversation with the land geek, and one of his big things was like, you know, my biggest thing is I know that I don't know anything. And, and going from that conversation to this conversation with Peter sort of emphasized that to me because, like, he started talking about neural networks and cognitive architecture. And I'm just like really trying to hang in there. But, you know, I feel like there's a lot of information gaps that I'm missing in order to fully understand, but nonetheless, extremely interesting person, extremely interesting subject matter. Uh, and one that I think will probably change the world more than anything else in the future. Um, you know, uh, coming in this conversation, I'm beginning my takeaways. This is my first takeaway coming into this conversation. Um, I, I really respect Elon Musk. So I sort of think about it through the lens of like, I'm going to trust that guy to figure it out. And he's like talking about how he's a fatalist about it. And, you know, he's very afraid of what artificial intelligence will do. And, um, I guess Peter sort of alleviated those fears and saying that, you know, if, if the machine is smart enough to, uh, to suck up all the matter in the universe to make paper clips wouldn't it be smart enough to ask why or to, to realize that that was not the right thing to do? Um, which I thought was, you know, pretty interesting. The second thing is starting small and how, um, you know, he's starting the chat bot and that might seem like it's, it's not anything like innovative or insane, but I think this sort of technology scales like exponentially quickly and that, um, just because he's starting the chat bot that the applications might be much more wide ranging uh, than what IGO is currently, you know, optimizing for or, or fixing. And it might, and the, the, the solution, um, might not even be one that they're looking for that, that like solves a huge market problem and gives them a lot of market value. Um, and then the third thing is just, you know, the PPP, the personal, personal, personal assistant is something that I'm looking forward to having, to having. Uh, I think that, it sounds incredible. I wish that I had a Jarvis. I think Lewis would, would like that too. Don't you yeah, think? you got to pre-order your PPP at lewisandkyle.com slash PPP. <laughs> Don't go there. It's, you'll get a 404. It's not PPE and it's not the PPP loans. It's it's PPP assistant, personal, personal, personal. That's what it stands for. P, school, P cubed, actually. You got to respect the guy's marketing effort. I mean, look how much we're talking about this. This was like not supposed to be the most interesting part of this interview. But what's got staying power? PPP. Anyway, are we done? Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm all good, Lewis. Go for it. Take okay. it away. First takeaway, similar to what you're saying about Elon, right? Elon basically, according to Peter, read a book by Nick Bostrom. And Nick Bostrom wrote that book because the money is in being an AI danger critic. 
and there's no money in being like a AI, general AI is gonna save the world. And that gave me a lot of interesting thoughts. If you let me put on my soapbox here for half a second, that's so true in so many industries that uh, there's someone named Justin Mayers who I'd love to get on the podcast one day that I'm sure you eventually will. And he wrote this piece about, you know, fake meat versus real meat. And the reason that fake meat is advertised is because they have like a 99% margin because they're selling like pea protein for the same price as like an actual hamburger. And like the cost to procure one and the other is like very different. Whereas meat is just like an animal. It's just, it just is. And so there's no one like advocating for that because the, mar the farmers are just kind of busy farming. And like the fake meat people are like, hey, we have a 99% profit margin on our soybeans. So here you go. Anyway, the interesting thing about that is that the version of the truth that is out there, the technology that's getting attention is kind of dependent on just who the people with capital or just kind of who ends up with capital and what those people choose to care about. So definitely let that be a factor when you kind of decide, you know, 99% of X industry experts agree on XYZ. Well, that's because you know, 0% of them have any level of income outside of their job. And the only funding is coming from this company that has an agenda doing X, Y, Z. That's just another reason to be a critical thinker and think from first principles or have a PPPPP think for you. Second takeaway for me is the benefits of being in one industry for a very, very long time. So like I said, towards the very, very beginning of this episode, Peter has been in AI since 2000. He said in earnest, he's been in it since 2000. So he's kind of been interested in it even longer than that. And that gives him kind of the perspective to see, you know, in the last eight years, if you said you're an AI, no one won't give you a check. In the previous eight years, if you said you're an AI, everyone's gonna say, LOL, I'm not giving you any money. So kind of being in one industry for a long time shows you the macro cycles that people who have not been in the game that long have understood. And that's a lot of the benefit from talking with someone like Peter, who's kind of a career veteran in this industry. Third takeaway, uh, I was fascinated by the way he characterized the Helen Keller, Stephen Hawking story in terms of one, the power of language, how just once that one barrier was crossed and the label language was able to be assigned to like the concept and of language, uh, that like opens the world for Helen Keller to like start understanding the world. And that's just kind of one of the interesting things about discussing AI is you just get buried in these conversations that take you to like the root of existence and the root of what is. That's what Peter started saying at the beginning of the podcast. He's like, I had a lot of time, a lot of money. And I started researching AI. I realized to research AI, I had to understand psychology to understand psychology. I had to understand philosophy to understand philosophy, epistemology. What do we know? How do we know anything? What is knowledge constructed in our brain? What is it? How do we encode that knowledge in a machine? So anyway, these are fascinating questions. So if you're bored and you want something better to do with your boredom, AI will certainly create many areas of curiosity. And that's more or less the takeaway there. Fourth thing, because I wrote down four is related to number one, there's just a technology skills deficit. This is like some fascinating stuff. And like, Peter's like, if you go to these conferences, you'll be underwhelmed because no one's actually working on this. And I think that's just because there are only so many people that have like technical skills or consider themselves capable of doing these things. So if you do upskill and tech up, uh, there's probably gonna be an opportunity because there's just a lot of interesting work and not enough people able to do it because there's just throwing money at the few people who can. So that's just a reminder that tech is useful. That's all for this episode with Peter. Check out his articles because the writing's pretty interesting. Check out his chatbot if you want to see what the potential of a true cognitive architecture is. And otherwise, make sure you're subscribed so you get the next episode from the Lewis and Kyle Show in roughly one week. Thanks so much for being here. We'll see you then. Bye-bye.